Cecilia Tamori is a Hungarian-American anthropologist and public health scholar whose work addresses health inequities through teaching, research, and active engagement in global and community health. Well, um, I grew up in Hungary. I'm Hungarian, and people in Hungary generally tend to breastfeed. And so, you know, it was just sort of understood that people breastfeed. I didn't really actually see it much, but it was something that was sort of surrounding the air. So, you know, I definitely come from a culture where breastfeeding is sort of taken for granted, although um, with the medicalization of breastfeeding, communities lost knowledge about how it actually worked. So I did hear about breastfeeding challenges in my own family that later I learned were created by the circumstances in which they were breastfeeding, but they took it to be sort of their own bodily challenges rather than the failure of information around them and the lack of knowledge. So that was really uh, interesting, but really I did not uh, learn about what the implications were until I actually studied breastfeeding later on. So. So what were some of the breastfeeding barriers that maybe were surprising to you? Um, later on, so, you know, I think as I myself became a mother in the U.S., so I was a relatively recent immigrant, you know, I, I learned English by then. I didn't know English growing up, um, but I had to, you know, learn the entire system, right? So it's not just, you know, learning a language, it's learning the entire cultural context and, you know, the interaction with the medical system. In Hungary, I grew up in a system that was very authoritative. You're supposed to follow the instruction of the medical provider. And, and in the setting that I grew up in, which was, you know, under the Iron Curtain, mind you, so in occupation and not exactly a wealthy system, you know, if you wanted to get care, at that particular time, you really needed to follow those instructions or you may actually not get care at all. So there was this very uh, straightforward relationship, like you were really trying to get the care that you needed and you were sort of at the mercy of the provider who was you know, considered to be the authority. And then you know, you're just trying to make your way through it. It's not, not exact, you know, this is what it's like growing up in a, in a middle-income country. It's, it's challenging. So I uh, assume that these kinds of relations were similar in the US, having no idea, you know, any of the historical background, you know, none of the research, I didn't know any of that. And so learning about breastfeeding in the US, I just assumed, you know, I was going to breastfeed and, and someone was going to like tell me how to do it, right? <laughs> and I was uh, mistaken. So, <laughs> you know, when I, when I ended up giving birth to my first son, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no real support. Uh, you know, my mom had breastfed, but like I said, she didn't really know what she was doing either because by that time, you know, in the seventies in Hungary, you know, the medical providers were not exactly helpful. So she had some struggles of her own. My husband obviously had never, you know, dealt with breastfeeding and he didn't come from a breastfeeding family. So it was complete cluelessness. And they of course sent us home with a formula pack at that time, it was still, you know, the, the most common practice. And so, <laughs> so we arrive at home and, you know, the doctor basically, I mean, they gave us the formula. So I assumed that, you know, you're supposed to do whatever the doctor says, right? So it wasn't working very well. You know, I was very sore. It was unclear if my baby was getting food. You know, I had no, literally, and I mean, zero, you know, so, you know, it's from zero to the breastfeeding expert. It's a quite a steep curve there, but um, no idea what I was doing. And so I actually told my husband, you know, I think we should just use formula. I mean, they sent it home with us, right? And so my husband, who again, came from a non-breastfeeding family was like, you know, honey, let me just check some books. <laughs> and so he, who, um, you know, like I said, really with no personal experience, the only saving grace that I think we had is that we both had a biology major from college, which did help to conceptualize the idea of mammals. You know, I think that was helpful and that I came from a setting, you know, that did breastfeed, but again, very little understanding. So he picked up a book at a bookstore, brought it home and started reading about breastfeeding and was like, you know, I, I don't actually think we should use formula. <laughs> And I thought, bummer, 
<laughs> Again, I guess I should try some more. And so once we started learning a little bit, we were, I think, set on this path, right? Obviously of learning how to do breastfeeding and, and eventually we kind of figured it out. Um, but yeah, the barriers were, were numerous, including our physician who was uh, not exactly supportive. And when we were trying to figure out sleep and you know, you, you know, and obviously your audience will probably know that I've written about breastfeeding and infant sleep before, when we were trying to deal with that with our own child, um, our physician told us that we should not feed the baby overnight and that if we do, this is at our um, six week visit, then it's sort of like um, encouraging our child to wake up for pizza at night. We're training him to wake up. And, you know, I remember walking out of that appointment thinking, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted, right? I just had a baby six weeks ago. The baby doesn't sleep that much, you know? And personally, you'd have to like pay me a lot of money to wake up to eat pizza at three in the morning. It is not something that I'd be motivated to do unless I really needed it. And so, you know, I think these kinds of encounters um, helped me realize how powerful the barriers were, but it was really not until I started studying it that I realized, you know, the extent of them. So it was, it was really after getting into this through uh, graduate work in anthropology that I started realizing how pervasive barriers were and how they were historically structured. And that's really where my interest led me ultimately is, is investigating these kinds of smaller interactions, realizing that they fit into a much larger historical pattern and that I wanted to know what those patterns were, what was driving them, and what we could do to change them. You've addressed a number of barriers professionally. And uh, one of the big, most pervasive barriers is the influence of the formula company <clears throat> on women's uh, perceptions of choices. Can you talk a little bit about that, that barrier? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, over time, that is an interest that became much stronger for me. I think I started with these smaller barriers and then realized that they led down a particular path. And so really, you know, investigating medical authority and the, the kind of power and, and influence the culture of biomedicine has had over infant feeding was sort of a first step. But then as I read more, it became clear that part of the issue was that health professionals were what we call are captured by the industry. And I think that piece was uh, very illuminating. So once you start seeing that the way in which biomedicine has become dominant had a powerful influence and in undermining breastfeeding, but that influence was hand in hand with the industry. And so industry interests were to expand markets and to expand profits from the get-go. The idea that these industries were sort of altruistic really needs to be questioned because when you look at the historical documents from the early, early part, you know, I was reading some of these documents where, you know, Nestle, who was one of the major players and one of the, the key founders of the industry, actually had this financial relationship with the local physician for that particular canton, who basically wrote this treatise, you know, that Nestle published that suggested that women's milk was insufficient, that mothers could not possibly feed their babies adequately, and that really, you know, after maybe if, if they could feed them at all, you know, after a few weeks, that this was insufficient. And of course, the solution that they needed was this product, right? And the product was Nestle's product. And I think once you see how this kind of framing goes all the way back to the beginning of the industry, then you start realizing that it didn't matter what that product was and how adequate that was or how, um, you know, actually, well, it would have served as a potential substitute because it was in no way adequate or comparable. But the point was to establish it 
as something that people believed it to be equal because that's what created that market. And then they took that market global. And I think that was also just such a sordid, terrible history. So, so they're undermining breastfeeding, you know, particularly in initially marketing it to people who are elite women who were already often um, hiring other people and in other settings, obviously, you know, exploiting people in different forms, you know, through enslavement and, and servitude to feed their babies. So elite women had this kind of special situation and they were a very, uh, quote unquote, useful market for this kind of propaganda about how milk was, their milk was inadequate and they just couldn't feed the baby and they needed this product. What they were trying to do at that point is undermine wet nursing as an institution. That was, that was how they were creating their market. But that didn't stop with this particular group of people. They took that market to everywhere, including you know, through colonial relationships that they were establishing because colonialism is all about exploiting people and using people's labor and extracting the maximum possible profit. And so what they did then was use a network of healthcare providers to drive that market and establish them as an authoritative source. So they did symposia, scientific symposia. They hired either real healthcare providers or even fake healthcare providers later on, dressed up later on as, as nurses in maternity wards. But the point was to use healthcare providers as a source of authority to essentially drive their market and establish it as you know, the norm to displace breastfeeding globally. And that occurred in all these different colonial settings around the world. And you know, I've written a little popular piece about that, but you know, the historical research on this is extremely interesting and strong and you know, led by you know, actual historians. I'm not a historian, I'm an anthropologist, but I use that work to make the arguments that I make about the larger forces of barriers. So you really need to see that historical evolution to understand how profound the influence of the industry is, how much they're driving this market and how they use um, whatever the local situation is, you know, the vulnerabilities of that particular setting, the work conditions that people may face that make it difficult for women to incorporate children into their lives. You know, in the US, obviously the complete lack of paid uh, leave for parents is a great opportunity. These are all marketing opportunities. And then, you know, like I said, the complex ways in which that market actually gets expanded involves a series of other ways of, of seeking authority. And so healthcare professionals are a key way in to these kinds of markets. And essentially people are being misled, systematically misled by the industry that uh, their products are equal or potentially even superior to breastfeeding. Um, and they make people feel as if they were insufficient. You know, just like in the 19th century, some of these uh, texts that I cited earlier made people feel vulnerable because they were told that their milk was inadequate and that they needed this product. Um, that is a strategy that has been pervasive. You know, the marketing strategies make you feel like what you're doing is not enough, that you're not feeding that baby adequately or that, you know, they're up at night because of breastfeeding. And these kinds of strategies are really powerful when you're exhausted and you have very little support. So, you know, as a, as a parent, certainly I'm quite familiar with that vulnerability. So as an anthropologist, what do you see uh, the value of, uh, you know, this, this presentation is for La Leche League Internationals Conference. And I'm thinking about my own experience of finally uh, connecting with a group of women and how I did feel empowered with these connections, mostly because of having someone model for me 
what this looks like because I didn't know. Right. And then I started to kind of absorb it and feel like I, uh, you know, it, it, I really have talked about this at conferences for years. <laughs> something from being with other women sank into my DNA or something. And I, and I felt a, a switch flip on and I felt like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this too. Because I could, you know, you can call it monkey see, monkey do, somatic psychology or, or quantum physics. I don't know. <laughs> something happened uh, in that process of being with women that helped me to feel more confident and discerning about was I being supported or not? Because then I had the experience of being supported, and I knew when I wasn't being supported. So I'm just wondering if you, as an anthropologist, could speak to a moment of the value of, because we're looking at ways over, under, and through, you know, the, these barriers, and the barriers seem almost insurmountable when you're talking about you know, 100, 150 years of formula companies strategizing and marketing and billions of dollars poured into that. And then healthcare providers being trained, uh, in, as you said, captured by that system in some ways. So um, and I'm looking for where, to, where do mothers, uh, fathers go for backup um, to overcome these really powerful barriers. Well, I think that we have some good news. I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, despite enormous barriers, you can see examples of success, you know, and, and in, you know, obviously globally, we have many different kinds of examples. And I think that there's multiple different strategies that we can use to overcome the barriers. So the most powerful ones have to do with structural change, right? So one way that we do this, you know, in anthropology and in public health, because I'm in both in anthropology and public health, I think uh, those of us who work in this arena, we recognize that the most powerful effects are at that structural policy level. So you can change policies to facilitate uh, breastfeeding, to create an enabling environment and to limit the kind of unbridled marketing efforts of these companies. So it, it, they do not need to be given free reign. You know, we can actually implement the World Health Organization's code, the international marketing code of breast milk substitutes. So we can actually do that. And, and there are examples of that. There's also other kinds of structural changes that we can make, which are you know, having to do with, for example, healthcare providers, healthcare provider training, and you know, uh, baby-friendly hospital initiatives that aren't supposed to stop at the hospital. We're not quite as good as uh, at taking some of those steps out of the hospital, but within the hospital, we've had pretty good success at changing the ways that things are done. For example, the fact that it's no longer routine in many hospitals to send people home with formula packs. I mean, that, you know, like in my own experience, I used that formula pack for years in lectures to illustrate how pervasive those influences are and what the marketing claims were. And these kinds of things, coupled with the endorsement of a healthcare providers, can break someone's journey. But we don't have to allow that to happen if we tackle those kinds of policies. Then, you know, building on that, obviously, community support is key. Like you said, we can pour much more resources into that and provide skilled lactation support to people that is also equitable and accessible because that is really what we're dealing with now is that we have people who could be wonderful providers but they're not necessarily accessible to people they may not be culturally appropriate to the people that they need to serve and so I think building that up would be an enormous uh enormously successful and we have obviously examples of that kind of success. I think the other aspect of that is recognizing, you know, the built-in inequities that I talked about, you know, this history that is, you know, tied up with capitalism and colonialism from the get-go. This is why we have these profound inequities baked into the system, you know, the elite white women's experiences are very different from people for whom these systems were essentially forced upon and um, exploited systematically throughout this entire history. And so reclaiming the traditions of breastfeeding in the settings where they were systematically undermined as part of these colonial medical efforts, including of course in our own setting in the United States, I think is a very powerful way of, of speaking back to those systems. 
And you know, within that, the supports that we have in our communities are, are extremely effective. So what you said about you know, something happened to you when you were watching it, we know from the scientific literature that that's actually you know, how people learn to breastfeed, not just from the scientific literature, from really experiential uh, learning. And breastfeeding was never meant to be something learned from a textbook. It was something that is surrounding you in the community, right? So breastfeeding friendly cultures, which I would not call Hungary one of them when I was growing up, that was a partially supportive kind of cultural setting. But in, in places where breastfeeding is, uh, you know, has been the cultural norm, which was the majority of the world until fairly recently, until, you know, about 150, 200 years ago, you know, you would see breastfeeding everywhere around you and, and people around you, particularly generations of women would be knowledgeable about how to address issues, you know, and I don't want to romanticize that because I know that in some settings, people had more cultural knowledge and resources than others. But for the most part, breastfeeding worked quite well in settings that were supportive, that had these communities of women, and usually, you know, uh, midwives were in charge of the entire spectrum of childbearing, but not on their own, right? There were other people who were also knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about these things. So I think we can do much, much better in facilitating these systems of support, and we have to continue to encourage people to seek these communities out as well. But I think we can make some policy decisions about how we do things structurally and how we direct money so that we can foster these kinds of supports and provide everybody with what they deserve, which is an enabling breastfeeding environment where they can make decisions freely free of you know, industry influence and when they're properly supported in their desire to breastfeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That was tremendous. You were able to cover so much there. So thank you so much for coming on. And is there anything else you would like for the conference attendees to, to know about your work or about you? Um, I mean, I think, you know, perhaps the, the biggest thing is to just continue to advocate, you know, at all the levels and to not and underestimate the power of that, right? So even though, you know, we, we do, of course, I can talk all day about all the barriers and how, you know, we continue to fight against them on a, on a daily basis. And, you know, of course, on a personal level, encountering people, you know, colleagues and friends whose journeys have been systematically undermined, you know, which is enraging. I think perhaps the, the one addition that I want to note is that um, during a time of pandemics like this one, it's especially important to pay attention to these kinds of issues. So we can't think about these kinds of processes like breastfeeding and lactation on their own. We need to think about them in the context that we actually live in. And that involves things like emerging infectious illness and climate change. We have, we're facing multiple emergencies at the same time. So what we need to do is think about how to integrate these issues into all areas. So rather than becoming sort of narrowly boxed in like, oh, you know, this is only important when we talk about, you know, uh, breastfeeding specifically, right? We really need to get out there and advocate to make sure that these issues are incorporated into all processes, because otherwise what we see is the cultural defaults kind of taking over often based on very outdated biomedical models that end up separating moms and babies from one another, that end up uh, providing opportunities for companies to take advantage of disaster situations, which is just absolutely horrific. So we really need to pay attention to supporting breastfeeding in these kinds of emergencies, some of which are quick emergencies like the hurricanes that we're seeing right now, and some of which are slower emergencies like the pandemic that is going to be with us for quite some time. So keep advocating to make sure 
that um, moms, babies, families are at the center of those policies and that lactation is always incorporated and supported in every aspect of what we do.